Um, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Um, today's webinar is titled A Broad Introduction to Different Types of Systematic Reviews, um, and we're really happy to have you all here. Um, just to ask, um, could you please all just make sure that you're muted and that you keep your videos off? This is just to make sure that um, everyone with different internet connectivity can be um, connected and also to make sure that there are no interruptions um, as we go through the session. Um, so as you'll know, this is um, one of five webinar sessions. Um, this is the first one um, and it's starting um, today, of course, and then there'll be uh, four others, which will be every Tuesday between three and five South African time. Um, and they will specifically be focusing on rapid reviews and scoping reviews. So today's session is really to provide um, a broad introduction to what systematic reviews are, because um, scoping reviews and rapid reviews, which will be discussed in the following sessions, are a part of um, what systematic reviews are. Okay, so um, the first part of our webinar will entail us getting to know you a little bit better. Um, there are quite a lot of us here, but um, we thought that it would be a good idea to just have a brief uh, Mentimeter with some questions. Um, and that just gives us a sense of who is here um, so that it, it's not too blank um, when interacting. Um, also, please note that um, we will be recording today's session. Um, but of course, you are free to provide uh, provide any kind of questions or comments in the chat um, throughout the session. So I'm going to hand over to my co colleague Zianda, who will be um, taking us through the Mentimeter. Um, and then when we come back, um, I'll be taking us through the content. There will be some times for questions and answers, and then we'll have the second part where we'll have a presenter, um, Mr. Amir Holfeld from Cochrane, South Africa at the South African Medical Research Council. So over to you, Zianda. Afternoon, colleagues. So I'll share the first link, which has um, two questions to the, um, on the Mentimeter. If you can just click on the link that I've just shared on the chat, um, it will take you to the first Mentimeter questions. So it should just first show the first question, what is your professional background um, that Zianda has displayed here? It will not allow you to move to the second question. Zianda will then give you permission to move on to the second question. So this is just to make sure that we can first just sort of view the results and, um, and then we can all move on to the second question together. Yeah, so 16 patterns, 17 are in um, academic um, researchers. Um, there's also health professionals, technical support, three full time postgraduate students, and one policymaker. So, yeah, yeah. It's, it's really great to see that there's a diverse um, range of people here. Um, so, that's really fantastic. Okay, so I'll just move to the second question. Yes. Great. So every so quite a few people are actually mixed methods researchers. Um, that's really good to know, and it's it's quite a, a useful skill set to have if you are thinking about doing reviews or using them to uh, make specific decisions. Um, so yeah, that's that's good to see. Okay, I'll stop sharing, and then um, I'll send you the link to the third and fourth question. Yeah, so we can see the responses coming in nicely for the third questions. Can you see that, B? Yeah, I can. Thanks. Yeah. Great. Also really great to see that there's a variety of um, intentions in terms of the webinar today. So that's quite good. Um, 
Yeah. Um, I'm moving on to the last question. Yeah, it also seems like a fair distribution between those who've attended um, training on reviews before and those who haven't. So that's also good to know and to see. Um, and so today, I think we will all be on an even playing field because um, it will be an introduction. Um, so, so maybe a reminder for some and some, some completely new things for others. Okay, thanks Yanda for sharing that. Um, I'm going to get started with um, the session. Um, let me just share my screen. Um, yeah, as I, as I said before, please share any questions or comments in the chat. Um, and also please um, stay on and please help us um, evaluate the session today to improve the future um, sessions. Um, so please do fill out the evaluation form that we'll share with you um, in the chat um, just before the session ends. Um, we also notice that there may be people here who would like to um, gain CPD points for um, their professional council memberships. So please do send us your um, council number um, in the chat. Um, please direct message to the host um, and then we'll be able to make sure that we arrange that. So just type in your name as well as your professional council number. Um, and then I also just want to briefly uh, mention that Session two and three, um, which are on introducing rapid reviews, as well as session four and five, which is on scoping reviews, will be sessions that build onto each other. So it, I would encourage that if you are available, please do as, attend them um, together. So do attend session two and three um, and or do attend session four and five. So um, just to start very broadly, um, systematic reviews are part of a research method called evidence synthesis. Um, and evidence synthesis is really any kind of research that tries to identify, select, and combine all relevant information on a particular research um, question. And this is usually information that comes from secondary data, so information that has already been published um, or is in the public domain. Uh, it's not empirical or primary research data. Um, there are two types of evidence syntheses, um, namely narrative reviews and systematic reviews. Um, and there are different types of narrative reviews and systematic reviews. And this is because they serve different purposes, but they also lead to different results and outputs. And so today we'll specifically be focusing on systematic reviews, but of course I'll give a brief introduction to narrative reviews so that you can just kind of understand and get a feel for um, what the difference is between narrative reviews and systematic reviews. So narrative reviews is the broad term that we use to refer to reviews that have a wide scope um, and where the methodology is not standardized. So this means that um, with the narrative review, the way that you search for literature is not necessarily um, systematic. It doesn't have to be transparent. You don't have to do a comprehensive literature search. Um, and also the synthesis doesn't have to be comprehensive. The time um, for doing a narrative review may also vary um, and you don't have to follow an established protocol. Um, and um, the authors of a narrative review may not necessarily state the methods that they use to search or to synthesize 
um, and they can be selective about synthesizing and presenting evidence, um, and that's specifically to, uh, to support a particular or a pre-existing view. So something like a literature review, for example, would be um, classified under narrative reviews. And then systematic review is, is a broad term that we use to refer to reviews that attempt to identify, appraise, and synthesize um, evidence that meets pre-specified eligibility criteria to answer a very specific question. Um, so systematic reviews, like in the term, um, are quite systematic and transparent um, in terms of the methods that we use. There's generally a, an established protocol before you start conducting the systematic review and a systematic review aims to address a very specific kind of scientific or practice question. Um, so very kind of narrowly defined um, review question. They are also very um, time intensive and can sometimes take months or even years to complete. Um, and the word systematic reviews is sometimes uh, used to refer to one specific type of review, but actually systematic reviews is a very, it's a blanket term for a wide variety of types of reviews. So um, often there's, there's this debate around whether there's a hierarchy between narrative reviews and systematic reviews. And of course it's, it comes from kind of the different purposes that narrative reviews and systematic reviews fulfill. Um, and of course, systematic reviews are considered to be um, somewhat more reliable form of evidence because they use robust and systematic and transparent methods. And they also summarize the best available high quality information that you can get um, from, from primary studies. Um, but systematic reviews are flawed. They do depend on the methodological quality of primary studies, and they also rely on whether you can access the, the uh, primary studies or not. So whether you have access to a wide variety of databases, for example, um, but they also um, have issues sometimes that relate to um, the way that they are conducted or the way that they're reported. Um, and as I've mentioned, it's important to consider that you know, if, if you would like to compare narrative and systematic reviews, that a key consideration is that they have different purposes. So there isn't really a grounds to say one is better than the other in terms of placing them on a hierarchy. In fact, we actually like to promote that they complement each other um, because systematic reviews generally address this very narrow, narrowly defined question. Um, but a narrative review provides you kind of a broad critique of on that topic. It allows you to interpret and reflect on the broad topic. So um, yeah, let's focus in on systematic reviews, which is really the focus of today's session. So um, when you think about a systematic review and what sets it as a, a part are a few aspects. And these things are things that we consider when we actually wanting to conduct a systematic review. Um, and the first thing is um, authors. So a systematic review of any kind requires for you to have at least two authors, usually more because um, when there are discrepancies or disagreements, the third author is there to help with that. Um, and also it's good in your review team to have a combination of content and methods expertise. So for example, if you are conducting a systematic review, a qualitative systematic review, you'd want to have people who have qualitative research skills. You want to have people who have skills in systematic reviews, but also people who have skills in the particular content area that you are conducting the review on. Um, a, a second big aspect that has to do with systematic reviews is the protocol. So that's um, usually done at the beginning of the review. Um, and sometimes um, the protocol gets published but it has to be there at the start, providing a detailed plan of the methods that will be used um, 
and the different criteria of the review. And this is all to be agreed beforehand by the review team. Um, then um, what is also quite important in the review itself is the question. Um, the question is generally underpinned by a question framework. Um, and uh, the most popular, I guess, question framework out there is the PICO framework, which um, consists of population, intervention, comparison, and outcome. Um, so this is really to be specific about who, what, uh, what kind of things you expect to, uh, to do your review on, that those things are clearly defined up front. Um, the search strategy for any kind of systematic review is also very comprehensive, and it should be something that others can repeat and identify the exact same studies that you've identified and included in your review. It also involves searching at least three electronic databases and other um, sources, so you could contact um, experts in the field or um, include um, studies that are in thesis um, if, if they aren't yet published. And also systematic reviews don't have restrictions on um, the date of publication, the language that studies are published in the geography. Um, and, and of course there are exceptions, but generally speaking, it's ideal to not have um, any kind of restrictions on the search. Then um, it's also quite clear in the protocol what your inclusion and exclusion criteria will be in terms of the kind of studies that you're looking at. And of course, these criteria are quite um, closely linked to uh, the review question itself. And um, this would be agreed upon in advance so that by the time you have your search records and you start selecting your studies, you're selecting them based on the criteria that you would have determined in advance. Um, in systematic reviews, it's also important to appraise the quality or the risk of bias in the studies that get included in the synthesis. Um, this is just important to, um, to kind of know um, and be transparent about um, the primary studies that are actually informing your synthesis. Um, and then um, in terms of the synthesis, traditionally systematic reviews sort of focus on including randomized control studies and including a meta-analysis where most of the studies were similar and um, they had kind of similar interventions, but um, the purpose and the types of systematic reviews have evolved and also um, with some topics, they, the studies are not exactly the same. They are similar and kind of um, have the same uh, criteria in terms of your inclusion criteria, but um, are not the same. So you then can decide to rather narratively synthesize the results um, instead of in a meta-analysis, for example. So this is just um, uh, a kind of a, pic a picture to show you um, how complex and the various stages and steps that can be involved um, in, when conducting a systematic review. Um, and it starts right at the top with you having to um, be very specific about your research question, uh, maybe doing a, a preliminary search to identify studies that you think would be included in your systematic review. And that preliminary search really informs your st search strategy, but as well as your inclusion criteria. Um, and, and then of course, um, you're wanting to determine which databases you will search, um, writing that all in the protocol and having that agreed upon in advance before you can go on to screening titles and abstracts and full text, um, which can be quite a layered, uh, process with several steps in between and involving um, your different um, co-authors. Um, and then also, um, in addition to the electronic searches, you may want to do some manual searches, um, which involve searching reference lists of included studies or contacting authors of the papers that you've selected into, the, into your review um, or contacting experts, etc. And then um, extracting the data and checking the quality of the primary studies um, and reporting that, and then going on to do your, um, your analysis and writing it up 
and hopefully publishing it. Um, and so that di this diagram is of course quite complex, um, but this is um, a diagram that we generally use to kind of simplify those different steps. Um, and Amir Holfeld, who's here, will be explaining in detail later what each of these steps entail. Another thing to note about sort of the, the layered process of conducting a systematic review is, is that it's quite good to be organized and to be systematic and transparent in, in how you make decisions at each of these steps, um, because these are the things that are usually reported um, when you want to publish your review or to when you want to actually um, disseminate this to those who will use um, the findings. So I'm going to start um, going through a few examples of the different types of um, systematic reviews. I'll, I'll provide a definition of them and, and their purpose and give you an example of these. Um, and for the first one, which we are going to discuss now is scoping reviews, which will um, take place. Uh, we'll have a detailed session um, at the webinars on the 12th and the 19th of October. Um, but the scoping review generally aims to map um, the existing literature in a field of interest um, in terms of volume, the nature and characteristics of the primary research. Um, and also it um, generally is, is conducted when um, you, you may have a complex field or the field is not quite heterogeneous, heterogeneous and you'd want to actually be able to kind of um, scan out and scope out and map out what is broadly in that particular field in terms of the research that has been conducted. Um, a scoping review is also generally a precursor to uh, another kind of systematic review. Um, so you may here decide to do a scoping review where you want to find out about the definitions and frameworks in a particular field. And those can then inform your question for a different kind of systematic review when you've identified what kind of gaps they are, when you've established a kind of a definition or the concepts in that particular field, and you want to build on and go in depth and focus on a particular and narrowly defined question. Um, and so you can then go on to do a, a different kind of systematic review. Um, they help to identify what is available in terms of evidence in the field, what the research or knowledge gaps are. They can help you clarify concepts or definitions. Um, they can also help you know the, the volume or the quantity or the type of research that has been done in a particular field um, or, or on a particular topic. And they can also help you identify key factors um, or characteristics related to a particular concept. So um, here's an example of a scoping review that we um, conducted. Um, it was, I think, published last year. Um, and the aim of this scoping review was to identify definitions of data harmonization in health in healthcare settings specifically. And we also wanted to know what are the activities, the components or the processes that um, relate to data harmonization, and then also see whether there was any literature published um, on the relationship or the link between data harmonization and health uh, management decision making. So another type of systematic review, and this is the one that is um, really popular. I think this is actually the one that um, where systematic review started is um, an effectiveness review. And this is a systematic review that assesses the benefits and harms of interventions used in healthcare and health policy. And they were generally first sort of published in, in the Cochrane database of systematic reviews, but there are now um, other journals accepting um, systematic reviews of effectiveness. 
Um, these reviews initially also primarily focused on randomized studies um, as sort of the most robust research design for assessing the effectiveness of interventions. And even now, um, I think it's still promoted that one starts off with randomized control studies when looking at um, uh, uh, the effectiveness of interventions. But of course, there are situations where randomized control studies may not um, have been conducted because it's just not possible given the nature of the intervention. And so there are other kind of um, large scale, uh, especially in terms of large scale public health interventions where you would consider including non-randomized control studies in your effectiveness review. So um, just to say that, you know, the, the Cochrane um, Handbook for Systematic Reviews of Interventions or Systematic Reviews of Effectiveness um, is a really useful resource um, to, that details the step-by-step -step processes of how to conduct a systematic review of effectiveness. Um, and in there, they also outline sort of the key uh, characteristics of what a, a, a Cochrane systematic review would look like. And even if you are not publishing um, a, a, an effectiveness review in the Cochrane database, I think it's still recommended in terms of the rigor of the methods to kind of follow the Cochrane methods um, for conducting systematic reviews of effectiveness. So this type of review has um, predefined eligibility criteria for studies. Um, and here specifically, the focus would be on the study designs. Um, you'd want to be very specific about which kind of study designs you would include, um, starting off with RCTs and then considering other more observational study designs. Um, and the method of, of Cochrane is also um, quite explicit, you, you, you should be able to detail everything in such a way that other researchers could conduct exactly the same re review um, and, and end up with um, very similar results to you or actually include the same studies and any other new studies that may have occurred after you, um, you finish conducting your study. Um, the search strategy is also very systematic and, and aims to identify all types of studies that would meet the eligibility criteria. Um, there's also a huge focus in terms of these types of reviews um, in assessing the risk of bias of the studies that are included. Um, and then also of, of very recently also the, the the need to assess the certainty that you have in the in the review findings themselves, and there are some very specific tools that one can use for that. So um, ultimately, when presenting results, one should be able to present results where you've transparently and systematically assessed um, how confident or how trustworthy you think that your results are. So um, here are just two examples of effectiveness reviews. And um, uh, this one, uh, the first one is um, on control measures to prevent occupational tuberculosis infection in healthcare workers. So there we aim to evaluate administrative, environmental and protective uh, measures um, in preventing TB among healthcare workers. And so we and an additional um, objective was we wanted to specifically focus on studies that um, assess these interventions in low and middle income countries. Um, we wanted to be able to ultimately say which of these um, interventions are most effective um, for preventing tuberculosis in healthcare workers. Then we also recently did a, a review, an effectiveness review, looking at different strategies for hypertension. Um, we evaluated um, mass targeted or opportunistic um, um, screening strategies um, in terms of reducing morbidity and mortality associated with hypertension. So as you can see, um, one of these reviews was published in the Cochrane database and the other wasn't. So, um, but both followed um, quite a systematic and transparent method in doing so. 
Um, and so it is possible to, to make a choice about where you'd like to um, publish your systematic reviews. Um, and yeah, and then a, a more recently kind of emerging type of systematic review is qualitative reviews. Um, and they include primary studies um, that look at people's perceptions and experiences of health, illness, services, sort of their societal factors. Um, it answers questions about feasibility of interventions, whether interventions are appropriate, what these interventions mean to people, how they are being implemented, and equity criteria as well. Um, so they answer questions around how and why, um, for example, how and why do intervention work, intervention work, rather than actually what interventions work. Um, and they can go beyond sort of just providing um, descriptions of people's sort of experiences or barriers and facilitators um, of people, for example, accessing a particular intervention to actually um, pr producing concepts and theories that go into detail about explaining and really interpreting how people make meaning of their own health and health related issues. Um, they, they can um, enrich interpretation of a particular phenomenon. So um, if you, for example, conduct an effectiveness review and um, identify a particular intervention as most effective, um, they can then help you explain and interpret why that, how and why that intervention would work in specific settings um, and what people's experiences are in terms of that particular intervention. So here are two types of qualitative um, systematic reviews. Um, one that we are starting to conduct now, which is around various facilitators and strategies for successful community engagement in infectious disease clinical trials. And um, we are limiting it specifically to LMIC countries. Um, but this one is really looking at identifying a list of barriers, a list of uh, facilitators, a list of strategies. So really um, just providing a very descriptive um, understanding of community engagement, whereas the, um, the Cochrane Review look, looked at factors that influence parents and informal caregivers' views and practices during routine childhood vaccination. So that one um, really is about trying to explain how parents make decisions around whether their children should get vaccinated or not. Um, and with that review, we actually then ended up developing a conceptual framework um, to explain that. Um, we didn't just list sort of what were the barriers and facilitators for, for parents actually taking their children to vaccinate, but why, didn't, why did they choose to or why did they choose to not? Um, and also this review um, contributed to enhancing understanding related to several intervention reviews or effectiveness reviews that had been conducted on this topic. Okay, and then um, on the 28th, which is next week, Tuesday, and the week after that, on the 5th of October, we'll be looking at rapid reviews in more detail. So we'll go through the steps of how to conduct a rapid review and then have specific examples. Um, quite interesting, the examples that we've chosen for this particular session will be on how um, policymakers and researchers used rapid reviews to provide evidence for, for decision-making during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so this, this review is it's quite suitable for that, I guess, because it, it's a review that accelerates the process of actually conducting a traditional systematic review. So there are a few, um, but very strategic shortcuts that one can take in conducting a systematic review. And that's what happens within the context of a rapid review. Um, and this is to ensure that um, you produce evidence as soon as possible, but also in a resource efficient manner. 
Um, and then just um, an example here that, you know, where when a rapid review was, when rapid reviews sort of started to emerge and, and become more popular was actually during the Ebola epidemic, um, where there were so many questions that needed answers and uh, around decision making um, to, to, to um, try and overcome the Ebola epidemic. And so that the same kind of trajectory has taken place with um, COVID-19. They are rapid in their nature, but they are still systematic and transparent. So um, this is an example of um, one of the rapid reviews that was recently conducted. Um, it will be quite interesting um, at those sessions because um, Catherine Houghton, who is the, the first author of this review will, will be presenting her experience with how they conducted this particular review. This is a rapid qualitative systematic review, which is also called a rapid qualitative evidence synthesis. Um, and it looked at um, barriers and facilitators to healthcare workers' adherence um, to different infection and control um, guidelines specifically for respiratory infectious diseases, really um, central to um, COVID-19 response work. Um, and then just to um, show you that in their review, um, the only thing that they did that was a shortcut was to limit the search to one database um, instead of the three required um, to limit obviously the amount of time that it would take to conduct the review. Um, and that was it. They um, went and they still had two authors for every stage in the review. They didn't apply any date limit or language limits or country uh, or geographic limits. So they tried really as much as possible to um, still remain systematic and to um, do not compromise too many of the, the stages in conducting the review. And then um, the last kind of um, systematic review I'm, I'm going to take you through today is um, called an overview of systematic reviews. <laughs> this is where it sort of really gets complicated. It's one, one level above um, systematic reviews. So it's actually where you compile evidence from different types of systematic reviews instead of primary studies. So in a systematic review, you're focused on evidence from primary studies here you are focused on evidence from multiple systematic reviews. Um, and overviews are, are really important in terms of um, signposting the reader to evidence. So um, maybe someone wants to find out um, what the different options of interventions are. And so they would go to an overview that looks at a particular health issue. And in there, they look at comparatively, they can see the effectiveness of different types of interventions that were assessed and reviews, um, what the options are and, and what kind of intervention would work best for which kind of setting. Um, and they also highlight if there's an absence of evidence. So obviously they would show um, whether there are any gaps in terms of the evidence um, and um, whether uh, you know, there are some issues that need to, to be explored further, either in terms of primary studies, but also at the level of whether systematic review um, needs to be conducted around a particular area. So here are two examples. Um, the first one is, is uh, an overview of quantitative systematic reviews or systematic reviews of effectiveness. Um, it's looking at different um, interventions for teaching evidence-based healthcare to health professionals versus when you don't look at any kind of intervention to, to teach them. Um, and as you can see, it, they included 16 systematic reviews. Um, so just really focusing on reviews and at, at that higher level. The second one is an overview of um, qualitative and quantitative systematic reviews. Um, and one of the things you'll notice in the title is the way that the overview is referred to 
Um, there are quite a few ways of saying overview. Some people call it an umbrella review. Some people call it an overview. Some people call it a systematic scoping review of overviews. Um, so a systematic scoping overview. So just to note that it is the same thing. It's really looking at synthesizing systematic reviews, but um, being referred to differently. And you can um, have an overview where you do combine studies that are looking at, um, or you do combine um, systematic reviews that are qualitative in nature or quantitative in nature, or just qualitative or just quantitative. And then I just um, thought it would be good to kind of visually present what I've taken you through now um, in, in this table. Um, and just to show that, you know, with rapid, review, with rapid reviews, they are partially systematic. Um, and that's just because some of the um, systematic steps may be um, sort of uh, shortened or shrunk or um, not generally, you know, um, taken away, but just uh, minimized to uh, be more efficient in terms of time and resources. Um, but they do get, gather data from primary studies. Um, they also still have at least two authors. They are done in a much shorter time period than what a standard kind of systematic review would would require, and they still do address narrow or, or very specific kind of questions. Um, scoping reviews, um, fully systematic. Um, what is important here to note is that they can um, have broad or layered objectives. So you could say, I first want to look at definitions of something. And then I want to um, be able to synthesize that and go and find frameworks that relate to specific, specifically to the definition I've chosen. And then I, I would want to go and um, I want to identify qualitative studies and quantitative studies and kind of look at them and analyze them. And, um, and so they do kind of sometimes go happen in steps where you are scoping the literature in that way. Um, but sometimes they're quite narrow. They'll look at a particular issue um, and they'll try and map that particular issue. Um, overviews, um, gather data from systematic reviews and not from primary studies. Um, quantitative reviews um, kind of go the full spectrum of, of things that they're able to do. They're able to gather data from primary studies um, they don't focus on broad or layered kind of research questions, very specific research questions. And the same applies with qualitative systematic reviews. So how are systematic reviews used in, in public health? Um, they're used to make decisions about um, policy and practice. Um, and whether, whether um, things work, how they work, um, where in which settings they work, at what cost. Um, so it really helps um, around kind of making decisions around different strategies um, or interventions or options. Um, and and um, specifically, I guess, in the context of policy and practice. Um, as you've seen with the example of the rapid reviews, they can really help um, to address urgent questions. Um, they can help to inform teaching and learning. We also had the example where one of the systematic reviews um, of effectiveness, um, a systematic review of overviews, I think, was conducted um, specifically looking at teaching um, evidence-based healthcare amongst health professionals. And so they can, in that way, also provide evidence for teaching and learning activities. Um, they can inform research gaps and funding proposals. So if you conduct a systematic review and realize that um, there isn't primary or sufficient primary research on, on, that, on a particular topic, this can be used to justify a particular funding proposal. They help us to reduce duplication and avoid research waste. Um, this is quite important because they help us to make decisions about which areas we should 
basically stop doing research in, but also which um, which areas then kind of uh, the focus needs to be redirected towards. And they help to advance methodological, conceptual and um, theoretical work. Okay, and then just I've just provided some resources that um, you can use. Yeah, are there any questions? Um, at the stage comments in the chat. Zianda, were there any specific questions? I'm struggling to. Um, I think there's one that I've just picked up. Um, it says in the introduction, what about, oh, okay. All right, no, that was for the men to meet. No, there isn't a question with regards to the presentation. Okay. I think there's one question in the chat box for the past. Uh, you know, the past. What about realist reviews? Yeah, so um, realist reviews are a type of review, um, and they, I haven't um, today presented all the different types of reviews that are out there. Um, but realist reviews are generally, I would say, classified under um, narrative reviews. I think they, they serve a really good purpose in terms of um, how they're sort of very theory driven um, and they, they're very good in terms of being used for evaluating um, specific kind of programs or interventions. Um, but I haven't um, included those here just because I haven't really focused on um, narrative reviews as, as sort of a, a grouping. I, I think um, though your question points to something that we are interested in hearing about, um, which is in the evaluation form, there will be a question on um, kind of learning needs that um, you may have. And I think if you put on the realist evaluation, I think that would be really good um, as something that we can consider in, in giving a webinar on in the future. I see some more questions are coming yeah, through. Yeah, more questions are coming in. Yeah, someone asked, what are living systematic reviews? So that's a very, very new area of work. And I think I may have left that in the slide somewhere, um, but living systematic reviews are basically reviews that are, con they are, they are systematic reviews, similar to systematic reviews of effectiveness or qualitative systematic reviews, but they don't have an end to them. So they continue, to, you continue to search and you continue to select studies and, and include studies in the review. Um, and at intervals, you'll, you'll publish and make available what you've um, selected into your review. But as new kind of primary research becomes available, you include that back into that review. And it's, so it's a kind of a continuous update and they have a long time span. So they, they can go up to like 15 years of doing a review on the same topic, but just waiting for new evidence to become available. Um, in fact, Amir was actually involved in living systematic reviews for uh, COVID-19, um, where of course with, for example, COVID-19, there wasn't initially a lot of evidence on different interventions around COVID-19. And so as new kind of primary research became available, those uh, reviews get updated and become uh, made, uh, made public for, for use and decision making. Can we use Google to search literature? Is there any situation which allows to use Google to search literature? So um, I think Google is a very good um, place to do your preliminary search, for example. So um, at the stage where you are developing your review question and trying to refine your review question, that's really a stage where I would encourage um, the use of Google, um, but um, in terms of being more systematic, in terms of your search, you want to be specific about which specific databases 
you um, you search. So there you will start to select databases like PubMed or um, Lilacs or Psych Info to actually uh, specifically use those because because Google, obviously Google Scholar specifically, will compile various and lots of scholarly, scholarly material, but you might want to focus in then and say, okay, I'm only going to search these three databases. Yeah, so um, then there's a question about what differentiates a rapid review from a systematic review apart from time frame. So yeah, that's a good question. So a rapid review is a, a systematic review. So a rapid review can be a systematic review of effectiveness. It can be um, a qualitative systematic review. And what really sets it apart is that you, you impose certain shortcuts um, in the steps when you actually conduct a review. So you may decide that, um, for example, during the search, you will only search one database instead of the recommended three. When you are, for example, selecting your studies, um, which generally includes two people selecting and screening titles, abstracts, and full texts, you may decide that actually one person will do the screening and another person will just um, check maybe 50% of the, the, the titles and abstracts to kind of work as a, as a quality check. Um, but it's really where you select out of the entire review process um, steps where you will take shortcuts to make it more time efficient and to make it more resource efficient as well. So an overview is a type of systematic review. Um, an overview is not the same and the distinction is quite uh, small and minor, but makes a huge difference. An overview includes systematic reviews. And so you are searching, when you're doing your search, you're actually searching for systematic reviews in an overview. But when you do your search in a systematic review, let's say a systematic review of effectiveness or in a qualitative review or in a scoping review, you are searching for primary studies. Um, so that's the key distinction. It's just a high level at which the evidence is synthesized. In the primary study, the evidence is directly from um, the, the environment, the participants, whereas in an overview, the um, evidence is from a systematic review, which is a summary of primary studies. So it's one, one level up. So I think the question about time is a good one. So someone just asked with that, um, you know, they're asking whether it's a hard rule to say that a scoping review takes nine months, could it take less basically, um, and will it be publishable? So with all of these reviews, um, the time frame is not set. Um, the nine to 12 months is actually a guide. And I would say now it's probably more like 12 to 18 months, just because there's more research that has become available um, and, and more people are publishing, more, more data is available, et cetera. But um, the time frame is not set. Um, and the time frame is not set because it depends on how many review authors you have. Are you working on the review full-time or part-time? Um, how big the scope of the review is. Some topic areas, for example, if you did a review on, on an HIV related topic where there's a lot of research, you would get a lot of studies versus if you did something on, I don't know, um, working from home technology where, where it's maybe a more emerging kind of area. Um, so just to keep in mind that the time frame is flexible and depends on several factors and how long you take to conduct your review. Um, if you are systematic and transparent and, and follow the correct processes does not impact um, the quality of your review. It, it should still be a good quality review, five months, nine months, 12 months. Um, And then someone is asking if there's a difference in the study selection of systematic reviews versus a scoping review. 
Um, yeah, there is. There are some differences. The first, I mean, the main difference will be um, in the review in the review type question. So a scoping review will ask a different review. There you will be looking for maybe let's say definitions or concepts. In the scoping review, you will actually be looking at maybe the in a systematic review, you will be looking at uh, interventions. And so um, how you set out your review question, your eligibility criteria will determine how you select your studies. You have to select studies that fit your eligibility criteria and therefore will be able to respond to um, your review questions, or your review question. Um, as well, um, to say that um, at the scoping review level, you might actually be, um, might get a lot of studies that you want to screen and look at the full text, just because you, you don't get to see definitions and conceptual frameworks, for example, in an abstract and a title. So you can't automatically exclude them. So there are some slight differences, but I would say primarily informed by what your review question is. Then someone has asked, what is the difference between a scoping review and an integrative review? I must be honest, I haven't heard about an integrative review before. Um, and I'm wondering if that is an element of terminology. Sometimes there are quite um, a lot of different ways in which we refer to the same thing. So I know that a scoping review, for example, also gets referred to as a, an evidence map or a mapping review. So um, it, it might be something similar, but I'm not sure. So someone is asking, can a scoping review be done for the implementation of healthcare interventions? Um, yes, just depending on what your question is. So if your question is to look at um, the, the number of studies, the characteristics of implementation, the, the activities, process, and, co and components that relate to um, a particular implementation of a healthcare intervention, then I think yes. But if you are looking at, you know, what are specific, um, what are specific implementation strategies and do they work or not, and um, whether those um, uh, whether those are effective or not, then that's a different kind of question. So it really depends on how you are phrasing your, your question. Okay, so um, I see that there are still uh, quite a few um, questions. Um, so what I will do is I'll start responding to some of the questions in the chat. Um, but I am uh, conscious of time and would like um, for Amir to um, be able to also uh, take you through the different steps involved in conducting a systematic review. And as he does this, I think some of these questions will become clearer to you. Um, and at the end, we'll also have more time for any kind of questions that you may have. So I'm going to hand over to Amir. Amir Hohfeld is, um, as I've mentioned, is um, a senior scientist at Cochrane South Africa at the Medical Research Council. Um, and yeah, we used to work together and uh, we're very privileged for him to um, be with us this afternoon. Over to you, Amir. Uh, thanks very much, uh, B. Um, I'm just going to turn on my camera very briefly so that you guys can all see or know who you're speaking to. Um, I'm going to share screen. And you can let me know if it is sharing correctly. Yeah, I can see it and it's it looks good. Thank you. I'm just going to stop video for bandwidth purposes. So um, thanks everyone for joining today. Um, as we said, my name is Amir Holfalt and I'm based at Cochrane South Africa, which is a unit of the South African Medical Research Council. Um, and then I also um, coordinate or co um, coordinate the um, or convene rather the um, evidence-based healthcare um, 
module course at um, UCT, which is um, part of the MPH um, uh, degree at, at UCT itself. So to briefly um, go over what, what we mentioned, I'm going to do the introductions to systematic views of effectiveness um, and just give you a bit of a um, bird's eye view of how the, um, the of the procedures um, that's required um, and just to note, I guess that every um, unit um, of um, this entire cycle um, that that we'll be speaking about um, almost requires a a hour lecture or sometimes a, a day lecture on itself. Um, so um, th there will be resources at the end for you to look at. So when we're looking at systematic reviews, we ask big deal or what is the big deal and we know that it's that um as B said that that it um, can be quite a lengthy procedure but at the end of it it's a very thorough um procedure um and if done correctly um and in a transparent manner um you can definitely um you know um hold firm that your results are an accurate representation of what's out there in, in the literature so um, the circle of the year just represents the various um, phases of a, of a systematic review, and we generally start with the very first of the year, which is formulating a question. So um, to set the scene for um, today's um, uh, lecture, um, generally what happens is that um, with, uh, with reviews, um, a, starts off with a scenario or with with um, a question of you know is um a drug a better than drug b or a drug a better than placebo etc um and a scenario that we um, like to use is um is one um as, as you can see on your screen where a young male um presents at a community healthcare clinic um for sti treatment and he basically tells his healthcare provider that you know, many of his friends are infected with HIV and STIs. He's worried about um, getting um, or being infected. And then he asks the healthcare provider whether um, circumcision is actually safe and can work um, against um, uh, or uh, potentially prevent um, H HIV or decrease your chances um, um, of, of contracting HIV. Um, as he's heard that, um, you know, circumcision um, could also be part of um, um the methods of, of preventing um infection so then as a health care provider or as someone working in in health or um one would ask well you know what is the best evidence and as we know when we're speaking about the hierarchy of evidence we know systematic reviews um are right on top of the list and followed by which are, are um, randomized control trials so what we do is we as I said, we formulate the question. And we also know that within this entire cycle over here, there are five principles um, that, that we um, um, adhere to. And that is um, asking the question, which is um, aligned to formulating the question, um, accessing or acquiring the evidence. And that is where we do conducting our searches. We appraise what we found and that is the quality assessment data collection. Um, and then we apply. So at the very end um, of this, one would then apply your, your findings um, as a policymaker or as a healthcare prof professional. And then you um, evaluate your, your um, findings. And if, if it's not um, to your liking, you may want to reformulate that question and do the entire procedure um, again. So based on that question um, or, or scenario, you would, you would have a certain certain questions. Um, so you'd ask yourself, well, you know, is circumcision actually more effective than um, not um, no circumcision at all? Is it cost effective and is it feasible? Um, and what does the current evidence tell us? And the question that that may um, come out or that may be formulated. Um, you know, if, if you are to conduct a systematic review on something like this is, 
what is the interventional effect of male circumcision for preventing acquisition of um, HIV um, by men through heterosexual intercourse, um, for example. So now you've developed the question and the next bit is now to actually develop a protocol. Um, and Pia also went over um, that little bit as well earlier. And the protocol is basically your blueprint or your plan of how you're actually going to tackle um, this um, scenario or the question um, to which you need the latest evidence for. So like we said, you formulate the review question, you define the, se the selection criteria using um, uh, um, PICO study design. Um, and uh, sorry, I, I probably should go back a bit. So when we're talking about PICO, we actually looking at, you know, what is the population you're looking at, the intervention and the uh, possible comparison, or if there is even a comparison and the outcome of interest. So like in this situation over here, our population would be um, males, um, our intervention would be circumcision comparison. There isn't actually really, so I mean, it would be to those that are uh, not um, circumcised and then um, outcome would be the um, incidence rate of um, infection, of HIV infection, basically. Like I said, you formulated the question, you now create that selection criteria based on your PICO, you um, determine a search strategy, so you lay out um, with um, help of a um, information specialist or a librarian, you know, how you're going to do your searches and where you're going to search. Then you critically appraise and summarize the outcomes and you then write a coherent and logical um, summary. So when it comes to actually conducting the searches, um, it needs to be formulated in a comprehensive and exhaustive um, way um, so that you can actually identify all relevant studies or trials, regardless of um, language or um, publication status. And because we're looking at what is effective, um, we would be looking at, as I said, when you're thinking of the hierarchy of evidence, um, uh, randomized control trials because that's the best manner in which you can actually assess effectiveness of an intervention. Um, obviously, if it is ethically um, uh, reasonable um, to do so. To develop your search um, very briefly, like I said, you, you'd break apart your scenario, um, you, you'd list the different concepts that um, for your, for your um, participants, um, intervention, the different names and synonyms of, of, of um, interventions, or what it may look like or, or, um, in the literature. If there is a comparison, um, you know, in this case, we don't have one, but for example, if it's a drug, um, some certain drugs have different comparison names, and then you list your outcomes and you study the science. So you just break it apart and you can then start developing search terms with your librarian. Um, using the Boolean operators, which um, in itself is, like I said, it's a half a day's lecture um, to, to um, kind of unpack the whole searching um, bit. I mean, generally what you do is you'd search in various databases like Medline PubMed, Embase, um, Cochran, Database Central, um, there are others like CINAHL, AIDSLINE, LILACs, and various others um, that may also be specific to your area of needs or questioning, like psych info and um, those kind of um, cases, um, which may be more specific to, you know, psych, um, psychology um, or behavioral sciences, et cetera. And you just do some hand searching through journals and through articles that you may find of interest looking through their reference lists. Um, um, and then also conference proceedings, um, especially obviously conferences that are um, in line with your question um, and, and topic area. So for example, if it's HIV um, um, area of, of interest, then you'd be looking for what are the big international HIV AIDS conferences around and what has been presented at these conferences. I think that's the personal communications so speaking to um, content experts or colleagues that are experts in the field and finding out what are the trials that have been um, conducted and um, that, that could be of interest to you. 
So very briefly, when you conduct searches, an example of a search that one could do in PubMed, it's obviously not, um, it's a very um, quick um, search. It's not detailed as what it should be, but this is just an example. Um, you'd go into um, PubMed um, to into the advanced search um, uh, area. You'd select title abstracts and you'd type in circumcision and in capitals HIV, and you'd find that there are about 1,442 um, results that that um, have popped up. This is obviously not to say that they're all trials, but um, or um, but but some of them are which could be. So you one would actually have to do some screening through it. And then once you've done your searches in your various databases, you kind of bring them all together into um, a reference package like um, EndNote or RefWorks, or even this um, online packages like Rayan, where you um, can download um, um, all your all your search results and upload it on, onto um, a package so that you can then start sifting through in duplicate and independently with your review partner um, for potentially um, uh, eligible studies based on the title abstract screening. And then this is just an example of um, what, what one could expect. So if you were to do a search, you may find that initially you find 10,000 articles, you then remove the duplicates because various databases will obviously have um, the same um, findings. So um, they duplicate, uh, they'll have duplicate trials. You then screen it, you exclude certain trials based on you know the title and abstract not meeting your criteria. You then go through the full text and um, find out, you know, was the population according to um, my population of interest um, from my PICO? Um, and was the intervention um, the same, similar, or is it just totally different? And you may land, land up with uh, 100 of, 175, or you may even land up with 25 articles. And the next bit is then to appraise, or, or sorry, uh, assess the study quality. And what we generally use is the risk of bias info, um, that info website, as you can see, that's the website on top, and we use the risk of bias to tool um, to assess the quality of, um, um, or the bias of um, the included trials that, that we'd, fi we'd find. Um, and then I've attached um, links at the bottom um, to some two workshops that, that are webinars that, that I've presented to explain a bit more about the risk of bias tool that we use and then also one on um, from from the risk of bias team um, in Bristol that, that have um, presented a series of webinars on how to use the tool itself. And then um, this is really the the output that one would find um, in um, systematic reviews and all that you do to produce where they break down per domain of interest, um, you know, where bias may have occurred. So for example, was a random sequence generation, was it performed well? It's unclear because it's orange allocation concealment in many of the studies of the year. Um, a great percentage of the studies that shows that it's high risk. So those are, are of concern, for example. And as you can see, this bar uh, graph of the year basically um, splits up your um, the percentage of, of, of the trials. So the year, this is 100% of all trials that were um, unclear with random sequence generation. And then you can see over here, this is about 25%, and the remainder um, of that, which would be 75, were, were all of high risk. The next bit would then be to do your data extraction. So you'd have a data extraction form that um, that you'd um, design with the systematic review methodologist, um, such as um, uh, B or, or myself, um, where we you then extract the relevant data um, to um, create um, a logical argument and summary um, of your findings. Um, so you'd describe the methods used in in the individual trials. Um, the types of participants, the type of interventions, how it was conducted um, and, and um, carried out. And this you do per child that would be included in your systematic review. You then go on to your analysis. So this is where you actually start meta-analyzing and bringing all those results together. 
And as you can see over here, this one is from um, a colleague of ours, Nandi Siegfried, um, who actually conducted a, a, a review on male circumcision to prevent heterosexual acquisition of HIV in men. And as you can see over here, um, this is what we call a forest park that, that then gets produced with all the individual trials listed over here. So they have three trials over here and the same three um, are measured again um, over here. And what they were looking at is the incidence risk ratio um, of acquiring um, HIV between zero and 12 months after um, circumcision or um, this is actually meant to be a 21, 21 to 24 months um, after um, circumcision. And then as you can see, over here, it shows that it actually favors um, circumcision. So circumcision can actually um, reduce your chances um, or one chances of, of acquiring um, HIV or being infected. And again, this is the, the risk of bias that they, assessment that they need. Then after um, you've interpreted your results, so actually in conjunction with it, you also look at the certainty of evidence. So how certain are you or confident are you that, that these results that are presented over here are actually reflective of, of truth? So you'd see in many cartoon reviews, especially they um, produce summary of findings tables over here. As you can see, they list the various outcomes. There are usually seven. Um, and they also produce a quality scale. So it can either be low, very low, it could be moderate, um, high, or very high. Um, and uh, this basically shows how confident or, um, or the quality of, of the actual evidence or how confident you are. So as you can see over here, when, when um, this particular study was looking at HIV infection um, based on lab tests or self-report, um, there's a low um, certainty in, in this actual result. And it may have been that they had large confidence intervals, that um, there was a high risk of bias, and all these various factors that, that get split up in, in um, a grade assessment, what is what they call it, um, is considered um, or gets taken into consideration in order to produce um, these uh, quality evidence scores as you can see over here. So um, just to speak briefly, so you may ask, okay, so, you know, has there actually been a systematic review that actually looked at, um, you know, um, circumcisions in in um, reducing HIV transmission? And the answer is yes. So if you actually had to go to kakshanlibrary.com, um, you would sign in over here. Um, and because uh, some of you probably may not have already signed in or signed up or registered in the past, it will ask you to register. And if you are based in South Africa, um, all South Africans have free access to um, Kakshan Library and, and the articles um, on it. Um, and that is um, thanks to SAMRC. So I'd um, advise everyone to register and to have a look through Kakran Library for the latest evidence, yet COVID related evidence. Um, there's actually a COVID page um, as well over there, um, or even um, other forms of interventions that are um, specific to your field of interest. So here, just, just briefly to show you, I am. Um, Try to do a very similar search as in PubMed um, in the Cushion Library and um, under um, the search. But uh, let me just show you how to get there. So after you'd sign in, you'd have an advanced search um, icon, icon over here or tab. You select it. And then it then brings you to this bit over here where you can do a very basic search. And over here, what I did is I said um, circumcision and I um, put the and over here with HIV, I then said um, run search. And I then received three Cochrane reviews and 292 um, trials. And as you can see over here, this is actually the, the one that was um, more um, aligned to my scenario that I presented earlier. Um, and this, we, we, we found actually all the forest plots. So as you can see, it's quite simple, easy to use. Um, if, you, if you have a clear question and 
transonic, you may even be able to find um, uh, systematic reviews in the Kashan library that answers your specific um, question. Um, if you, however, don't find it over there, there are some other resources. Um, and if you don't find it anywhere, then it's a good chance that you've actually landed on a potential question um, that actually needs um, a systematic review to be conducted. Um, as we said, general practice is that if there are systematic reviews, especially if they are up to date, we do not redo a systematic review um, because that would just um, speak to um, duplicate of, of efforts and resource wastage, which you probably won't find anything new to begin with. And then just to add um, or to end off in, um, if you are looking for online workshops and resources, you can um, visit our Caution South Africa YouTube ch um, channel um, where we post links up quite regularly. We also have Twitter pages um, at Caution Africa and at SA Caution where we um, advertise bursaries, workshops that we that we are um, hosting um, and various lessons. Um, and similarly, you can keep up to date with the latest news um, on evidence-based healthcare um, through our website, um, and these are the links over here. Thank you, everyone, for um, listening. Um, over to you, B. Thanks, Amir. Um, I think there was a question, um, but if if you would like to type in questions, now would be the time. Um, Amir is still here to answer any. Um, kind of questions. Amir, the first question is, um, is the risk of bias and quality appraisal the same? And I assume that um, you could maybe add, is risk of bias, quality appraisal, and assessing the confidence and review findings the same thing? Um, and what tools are used for um, different study designs apart from RCTs? I think that's quite a, a good question. Yeah, so um, there does seem to be an overlap and confusion, I guess, when it comes to um, terms. So um, I guess quality itself doesn't really, um, um, when you're speaking about risk of bias, you, you, you are leaning towards speaking about quality of the actual trial itself, of the individual trial. Um, and, it's specific, and, and it's important to note, not, you're not looking at the systematic review, but at the, the trial itself. Um, and that's why we'd, we'd say the quality of the trial, looking at risk of bias um, of it. But when we're talking about quality of a review itself, um, we actually, what's actually meant is, um, and they've changed that terminology to looking at more at the certainty of evidence. So how certain are you in your, in, in your systematic review findings rather than um, quality of it? Um, and then also when it comes to risk of bias, and so, like I said, you'd use um, risk of bias to tool for RCTs, and then there are um, tools like Robin's Eye, which is produced by the same group um, by risk, um, from the risk of bias.info um, that's found on risk of bias.info um, web page, um, which is for non randomized trials. Um, others have also used New Ottawa Scale in the past. Um, or Hoy's criteria um, for prevalent studies, um, and then there are various others for, for qualitative reviews. And um, thanks, B. Okay, um, and then um, there's another question. Um, if the studies are of different study designs, how would you assess um, their quality? So how would you go about critical appraisal for studies of different, well, for different study designs? So um, when it comes to different study designs, uh, you would first start off with RCTs. And if you find RCTs, there's no need to actually look at other study designs like code studies or um, case control, et cetera. Um, because, you know, you, um, the RCTs in itself should be good enough um, to be able to um, get you to as close to um, what we'd hope to be the truth as possible without any um, inherent biases. Um, but there are cases sometimes when there are just no RCTs and people may then use um, or need to use code studies um, and other designs. 
if that is then the case, then um, you'd you'd uh, use um, use Robin's eye, like I said, or um, or Newcastle Ottawa scale um, to assess these. But you'd also um, you'd also analyze your findings separately from each other, so you wouldn't like combine cohort and case control um, findings together, because um, that's almost like considered mixing apple and oranges. Um, you want to keep them separate. Um, and and maybe just to add to that last question as well. So um, I think in terms of the this quantitative systematic reviews, like effectiveness reviews, um, Amir explained that quite clearly. But for example, um, with qualitative systematic reviews, you may have um, also different study designs. You may have studies that specifically are sort of um, uh, ones off interviews that were conducted versus more longer term ethnographic studies where um, interviews, participant observation, conversations, etc., also occurred. Um, and in qualitative um, research, you may actually be able to um, assess the quality of those primary studies um, using the same tool. Um, so there are quite a variety of tools. And what I'll add to the presentation is actually a paper um, that was published that looked at, I think it is a systematic review, it looked at about a hundred and something different types of tools for being able to critically appraise studies. So in that you'll be able to find quite a different um, variety in terms of the study designs, but um, it's also really good when you're looking for critical appraisal tools to look at recently published um, systematic reviews. So the type of systematic review that you're interested in or um, rather search for a similar systematic review that um, was conducted and then look at what kind of critical appraisal tool they used. Um, you'll find that some have um, more crit critiques and feedback um, than others. So you want to use somewhat a, a validated, I guess, critical appraisal tool if you put it that way. Um, so if you do search and look at other systematic reviews, you'll be able to see what is quite popular and common, commonly used. Um, okay, and then I think someone asked, what are the tools for appraising observational studies? So Amir uh, mentioned those and he just responded in the chat. Newcastle Ottawa is quite popular and Robin's Eye as well. Um, there may be some others, but these are the two that are um, well known and well used and their limitations are also quite clearly stated so you may be able to know how to use those um, um, in your own review. Um, I've also included in the chat the link to the evaluation form. Please, please help us evaluate and please do send your professional counsel number to um, Zianda. Um, I'm just looking if there were any kind of quick questions we could address um, in the time that we still have left. Is there any approach to account for hand-searched articles in Prisma? Yes, so um, Prisma for um, everyone else is um, the, so there are two things related to Prisma. So there may be a Prisma reporting guide, Prisma, um, can be a checklist or a document that helps you to see that you've included the various components that are required in your protocol or in your publication of your review. So it can be a reporting guideline or checklist. Um, but Prisma can also refer to a flow chart that you include in your review about how your search happened and how you basically ended up selecting and synthesizing particular studies. So for example, in your PRISMA, you may be able to say, okay, you searched these um, three databases and you got a total number of records. And then from those records, you went on to screen titles and abstracts of how many of, the, of that total um, after, for example, removing duplicates. And then you kind of move on to explain how many um, of the titles and abstracts you wanted to get full text articles for. So it's kind of this process of explaining your search and your selection up to the stage where you say, okay, these are the number of studies that I've included in my review. 
And so even with hand searches and other kinds of sources that are related, that are not um, from your electronic databases, like um, studies that you identified through, for example, experts in the field, hand searching by looking at reference lists of similar systematic reviews or the primary studies that you've included, all of that um, can get included and all of that will then contribute to the number of records that are screened and um, ultimately the number of studies that get selected. Sure, the one, um, um, so I don't know, and maybe Amir can respond to this. Um, I, so I don't know a lot about health technology assessment at all. Um, so unfortunately, I would have to find out about that and try and um, respond to that in the, in the questions and answers that we compile. But I don't know what the relationship is between systematic reviews of effectiveness and health technology assessments. Amir, do you, do you know? Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not too clued up either, um, but it's something we'd have to look into and, and get back to you on. Yeah, so I think, um, yeah, we'll, we'll get back to you on that one. Um, are, there, are there colleagues here who, who know the response? I mean, we could help each other. You could add it to the chat or you could unmute yourself if you, if you have an idea. Um, and then there was also a question around, um, yeah, so using PICO. So that's a very good question. And um, initially I also mentioned that PICO is one form of um, a question framework. So there are other types of um, frameworks that you can use to um, develop your review question. So for example, SPIDER or SPICE, um, various other kinds of acronyms that also consider things like context, um, the phenomenon of interest, the type of study design, et cetera, et cetera. Because um, this PICO thing is specifically focused on review questions that are interested in intervention. So they are comparing an intervention to some kind of control um, which can be the absence of an intervention, or it can be another type of intervention. But for example, in qualitative studies, we're actually more interested about the setting, the context, the actual population, the phenomenon of interest, um, which would be the issue that you're interested in. We're interested in people's perspectives and views and experiences. So that gets captured differently um, in those different um, question frameworks. Um, okay, I think there was another um, question. Then there's a question about Prisma and consort reporting formats. Amir, do you want to attempt that? Um, so the question is, what is the difference between Prisma and consort reporting? And um, so, yes, yeah, so when it comes to Prisma, it's, it's primarily, um, focuses on like the reporting of reviews, evaluating the effects of interventions. Um, and, uh, you know, it's basically just looking at, at, at um, the structure in which um, you would you'd report a systematic review and ensure that, you know, you've got the relevant um, details in, in the various sections. Um, and then when it comes to um, consort itself, it's, um, I need to kind of just make sure that I'm, that I'm um, remembering it correctly now. Um, yeah, so consort itself, I think, is more looking at um, the reporting again of, of the of the trial. So that's what a trialist would use um, to ensure that you know that covered the the various um, areas. Um, so like there's almost like a checklist that they need to go through and um, to ensure that, you know, that they've provided enough information, for example, that they've described an anonymization process um, um, in enough detail or um, the methods in enough detail. Um, and then 
it also speaks to um, part of it also speaks to that whole flow diagram similar to the prisma that I showed previously, which is um, uh, for systematic review. So um, a child in itself would have a have a similar um, not similar, but I mean would have a diagram of the patient flow of how many patients were you know initially um, um, screened. Um, um, to partake and were randomized and how many um, uh, were lost to follow up, et cetera. And so those are kind of the, the, the differences. So if you think in consort, you're speaking more towards the child itself, um, whereas PRISMA speaks more towards systematic views. Yeah. Um, and then there's a question about how would you come up with such terms? Yeah. Um, I mean, that's quite a complex one to ask because, um, so what I actually forgot to mention, which is quite important is that within the context of a review, besides your content and methods experts, um, generally, if available, you'd also want to consult a librarian or an information specialist, someone who generally works with databases knows databases, knows the different ways in which to search for databases. So when you develop your search strategy, you generally develop it in, in conjunction with someone who has those um, expertise. But how you generally develop your search or identify relevant search terms is by looking at your review questions. So the, the, the question framework, so for example, your PICO, some of those elements that you capture in your PICO would be what would help you identify search, um, search um, terms. So for example, in the example that Amir presented, males would be kind of a population of interest. So that would be a search term. Um, circumcision is obviously one of the issues and, and interventions related to that. And then um, generally we don't um, capture the control because not all studies in their title or in their abstract will automatically say, you know, it, this is, there's no intervention or it's being compared to intervention B or whatever. So we just kind of leave those out. And we also sometimes um, leave out the outcomes. So we, we don't um, want to necessarily put in the outcomes because outcomes may vary. Um, so what you do is you use some of what is in your question to identify search terms relevant to that. And there may be other words for um, what circumcision may be referred to, or, you know, in the case of, for example, males, it's males, men, uh, boys, etc. So you might have a variety of other options of terms. And in combination, what you start to do is you start to develop kind of search strings. So you'll have a string that describes um, different terms for males, and you will have a string that describes different terms for circumcision, and you'll put those together and start to um, develop your search strategy like that. But I think um, what you are pointing towards is something that we've seen a lot in our setting, which is actually there's also a need around training in terms of how do you actually develop your search um, strategy. So I think that's something that we can also um, note down. Then um, Janine, hi Janine, Janine and I used to be colleagues, um, is asking if there's a framework to use for policy or health systems types of review orientated questions. Um, yeah, I think that's an interesting one. I would imagine um, that some of the health systems or policy related questions would be more qualitative in nature and therefore frameworks like SPICE or SPIDER would actually be relevant because they would be maybe, uh, you'd be able to capture things like the health system setting or the level of the health system that you're interested in. You'd be able to um, capture the population, so the health uh, policy makers or health managers, but, but also the phenomenon of interest, that, that the phenomenon that you're interested in. So for example, if you're interested in a particular populations uh, in the health system's way of using research evidence or something like that. Um, so you might actually be able to use more qualitative um, research quest uh, question frameworks like SPICE or SPIDER, which are the two most um, common ones. 
Um, and of course, that will also depend on the type of review um, that you are setting out. Something like a scoping review may, may not always necessarily follow a very neat kind of question framework. And it would be your, your responsibility then to identify what are kind of the important components of the question that you're asking um, and, and lay those out clearly. Yeah, so what to do if your um, search terms um, result in zero hits in the database? So that this sometimes happens um, for several reasons. I would say one of the most obvious reasons is that um, there isn't research on your particular question, um, but most, most of the time I would say there isn't uh, for it to already show up as zero in the database, you are either not using the search terms that um, that database is most familiar with. So there might be different ways of referring to something. You might have to maybe in some databases spell out the entire word or in some they use abbreviations or they use a synonym, etc. So if it's not indexed according to um, the specific terms that you're using, you may not, as a result, be finding um, what you're looking for. And one way of overcoming this is actually by searching for a study, a primary study that you think um, is sort of relevant, um, broadly relevant to your topic area and looking at how that was indexed, the terms that they have in their um, mesh terms are also something that some databases have where it's kind of a family of words um, that relate to the specific component. So this is really where working with a librarian or an information specialist may help. Um, and another reason could be that your search is too narrow. So you've basically used um, males and circumcision and that's kind of it and you just restricting yourself to that and you're not really presenting options like male or man or boy um, or just nothing. I mean, or, or filtering, for example, there are also filters related to humans or animals. Um, it might also be the particular study design that you're looking at. So if you're very specific and you're also filtering by study design, by a specific, a specific date range or geography or language, you might encounter all these problems where if you are searching for, um, for firstly, for, for um, studies that are most recent in maybe a non-English database on a particular topic that you know affects countries where they speak English, then as a result, you may not be able to find something. But often it's just because your search was maybe not constructed that well, and you just need the advice of an information specialist. Um, and so that would be my advice for you to, to get those specialist skills that you need to, um, to develop your search better. Okay, I think we've come to the end of the questions in the chat. Um, not sure, Amir, Zianda, if there are any comments from your side. Um, but we've taken note of the suggestion to um, compile the questions and answers. I think that should be an easy thing to do, although um, I also think now that we've managed to actually answer them and they, this is being recorded, so you will have access to them via the recording. Um, and then I'll just add, you know, some of the, the, the links that Amir has shared, for example, um, on the last slide where I shared resources for you to also have access to that. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Um, Amir, last words? Um, thanks everyone for joining and um, good questions posed and hope to be in contact with many of you in the nearby future. If there's any questions um, or assistance you need with systematic reviews, feel free to uh, drop me an email. I think we can share it um, yeah. sometime. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks, thanks very Pete. much, Amir. Um, Zianda, do you have any last questions, comments? No, B, nothing on my side. Just to say that I've noted all the direct messages. 
um, for the CBD points. Okay, thank you very much. And the recording and the presentation will thank be- Thank you very much. I've learned okay. a lot. Thank you. The recording of the presentation will be shared with you via our website, but also um, we will share it to all those participants who've registered. So you should also be able to get a link to it um, via email. Thanks, everyone. Um, take care and um